The topic of my presentation today is the interplay between the ICC and other international courts and tribunals from the Nuremberg principles to the latest ICJ case law. Of course, during my presentation, I'd like to respect the, uh, the information within in the invitation that we are supposed not to discuss the lift cases. So I've taken the topic from another perspective. I'll focus uh, only on ICC and other international courts and tribunals, not the mixed tribunals, mixed courts. Second, um, when I thought about <coughs> the outline for today, I've realized that there are two possible ways to get to the topic. One interplay <coughs> is developmental. It means that the Rome Statute was not adopted in a legal vacuum. And that's the way how I would like to show how the Nuremberg principles have already been there even before 1950 when they were published in the Yearbook of International Law Commission. But afterwards I realized that within all that developmental interplay as I've already said, that's the part that you must have already studied and done research within. And that's why I've decided to add another part, and that's it on actual interplay. Are there any reasons to think that Nuremberg principles might be a formal, formal source of international criminal law? Um, my submission is it is not. Nuremberg principles are very important, and the whole process adoption of the <coughs> Nuremberg Charter and the judgment and then the principles in the uh, work of international commissions that's a very important legacy and material source of international law but not a formal one. So just to keeping that 20 minute uh, slot and the fact that within the topic there was the ICJs <coughs> I'd like to start with the fact that as for international law as such the basic subjects are states. But it was already said in 1949 that states are not the only subjects of international law. As we already know uh, in the advisory opinion of the ICJ, there are other subjects of international law. Uh, it was confirmed that already in 1964, <coughs> when the judgment of Nuremberg was adopted, and it was said it did not entities like states, but st like states, but individuals commit international crimes. So the advisory opinion actually confirmed the existing state of law at international level. It is the same for the second Nuremberg principle. It means supremacy of international law. It is not the jure present in any of the later establishing <coughs> instruments of international judicial bodies, but that's the way how they work. Of course, there is the difference if they have been established by resolution of Security Council or by international treaty, but nevertheless, it is the international law that is decisive. As for the ICJ, domestic legal framework, that's only, if not talking about practice, pure fact. As for the ICC, as we'll see in accordance with Article 21, the interrelation between international and domestic legal order is different. The third principle, irrelevance of official capacity. Uh, I'm of the opinion that we've got to distinguish between responsibility and prosecutability, as it was uh, provided so also by the ICJ in its quite famous Eris Warren case. Nevertheless, um, these two concepts are as if mixed in so-called ICC Jordan uh, Appeals Chamber decision. Uh, we all know that, and it has already been discussed here in previous presentations, that uh, it does not matter who you are, what, fun what function you hold, you are responsible under international law. Yeah. Nevertheless, there might be, especially in relation to jurisdiction, some other issues that the international judicial bodies have to keep in mind when deciding about jurisdiction. The fourth uh, developmental interplay, the fourth principle of Nuremberg, um, 
it uh, was for me quite difficult to interrelate with ICJ uh, case law. Nevertheless, as for Nuremberg, there was the absolute approach to uh, defense of superior order. Uh, on the other hand, and so were the uh, ad hoc statutes. For the ICC Rome statute, as it has already partially been uh, represented here, there's the conditional responsibility. It is understandable because ICC is Profutura Court, and of course, states, when adopting an international treaty, they are aware about what has already been uh, presented here as well, that th that might uh, one day somehow um, influence position of their individual nationals. Nevertheless, as for the ICJ, it has already been declared in genocide case, I mean the, that case concerning Bosnia and Herzegovina versus Serbia and Montenegro, that uh, <coughs> these responsibilities might and do occur next to each other. What is pretty clear, and I presume that it has, it has already been presented in uh, not a presentation in relation to aggression, that not only genocide, but also there is the crime of aggression where only it is a leadership crime and only readers can commit <coughs> this crime at international level. Uh, right to a fair trial, especially in relation to victims' rights, I think, um, Madame Pelé, that it would take two year, not two day conference, but two year study program to include all the aspects. But it is true that if we compare the Nuremberg fair trial, um, or the, the, the article in the Nuremberg Charter that uh, puts down the, the, the fair trial principle, it is uncomparable if we take only Article 67 of the Rome Statute, because there are other <coughs> articles that include issues of the right to a fair trial. Of course, because it's not only international criminal law, but also international human rights law that has developed since the Second World War. And especially, as I already said a minute ago, um, very special approach to all previously forgotten victims' rights. As for the sixth principle, when I started putting the case law of ad hoc um, tribunals and then the ICC tribunals, and then I realized that my presentation would be the, the second day and that all the previous presentations concerning aggression, war crimes, crimes against humanity and genocide have already be, been presented. I don't think that I have to add anything else to their presentations. And that's why I'd like to move to the seventh Nuremberg principle. Not talking a lot, because very well presented by Professor Pavlis in the previous uh, panel. I just would like to point out that it is really so that since the Nuremberg system, it was pretty clear that not those persons who shot somebody else, but especially those who are in charge of them, should be held responsible as well. There, are, there have been different approaches from different international judicial bodies, because in uh, Nuremberg um, there were some organizations declared criminal to somehow help um, prosecution of individuals at later stages, because it, it was supposed that other trials would take place in different uh, courts. It did not take place at that uh, perspective. Uh, nevertheless, the complicity as a crime and under international law, that's the seventh, uh, seventh Nuremberg principle, and it was present, of course, also in the Nuremberg principles adopted by the work of International Law Commission. As for the ad hoc tribunals, the approach was different. It was a subjective approach. There's been uh, incredible academic practitioners work upon uh, subjective approach to embodied in uh, JCE. The ICC, as has already been presented in the previous presentation, has decided to go another way through the matter of control. It is so-called objective approach. Essential level of control has already been presented and maybe Professor Pavlovich will explain in his present in his 
written uh, uh, contribution also substantive or significant level of control that is elaborated up on within Article 25 of the Rome Statute. Statute. And since uh, the topic of my presentation was supposed to be also ICJ case law, uh, in my written contribution I'll write also uh, upon comparison of effect in an overall control it means. You know, different perspectives from the fact that ICJ, that's about states. ICC, that's about individuals. And now, having said that, I still hope that I've got, because now I'm going to something that you maybe might not have thought about, and that's actual interplay. Because it is a fact that all the Nuremberg principles have been embodied in the ad hoc tribunal statutes and also in the Rome Statute, apart from the second. But as I've explained, since these are international judicial bodies, the fact that there is supremacy of international law, it's in their birth certificate, in their establishing documents. So um, what about ad hoc tribunals? What about the ICC? Do they mention decisions of another in their decisions. I've chosen uh, some examples because what is a fact that all judicial bodies have to act in accordance with their establishing instruments. And as for international judicial bodies, we've got to keep in mind Security Council resolution, we've got to keep in mind uh, the fact what is applicable law for them. As for <coughs> narrow bank judgment, might it be considered as a precedent? Um, we are most of us civil law lawyers. Nevertheless, precedent as such is considered to be a legal source when it establishes new legal norms. But for, as for Narbeck judgment, it has been declared already at the time when it was adopted. No, it decided upon already existing law. That was the reason for the rationale behind the Narbeck judgment, especially in relation to the crime against peace. No, we are not declaring new law. We have decided upon already existing <coughs> law. In that case, from the theory of law approach, you cannot consider Narbeck judgment to be a precedent. So what is it then? And what are Nuremberg principles? Is it a custom? General principles of law? What is it then? And why sometimes do international judicial bodies mention them? If we look again at the ICJ, as I was asked to do so, everybody knows by heart Article 38. And I think that Nuremberg principles, if you talk to your students, is a perfect example of so-called instant custom. It is not a concept that is taught these days. Nevertheless, the, the aftermath of the Second World War was such a switch of the understanding of international law that concept of the instant custom, especially in relation to the General Assembly Resolution, the fact how it was declared, and that the International Law Commission only formulated the principles, not declared them, might be considered the fact that number principles <coughs> are an international custom. Why is it important? I'll explain it in relation to uh, uh, Article 21 of the Rome Statute. Rome Statute. It's an international treaty. Might it be possible in relation to some aspects of the Rome Statute, there is an international custom appearing in, in relation, for example, to war crimes? And the third issue in relation to the Article 38 of the ICJ Statute, there are, of course, other sources of international law, not mentioned there, for example, the Security Council resolutions. So the fact how some cases, some, in some situations within the ICC system are tri triggered. And these are the questions that I'd like to evaluate more in my uh, written contribution. As for ad hoc tribunals, <coughs> perfect case to study in relation to how to interact among existing 
well, ad hoc tribunals are not there anymore, but uh, when the decisions of the ad hoc tribunals were adopted, the Rome Statute was created. So how that interaction took place? Kupreskic case was perfect, or is a perfect case study also for the presidential system, because it explains the, the issue of precedence. It explains the issue of hierarchy within, even with the, uh, within ad hoc tribunals themselves and also the relationship to other international judicial bodies. And the, the um, conclusion from Kupreskic's case was that we cannot refer, formally speaking, to Nuremberg. The first of all, there is our statute. That's uh, establishing document for our existence and also for our functioning. And what is the important article for the Rome Statute? for the ICC, Article 21 of the Rome Statute. I'm starting here um, as if from the end, because it has three paragraphs. As I've already said, there is not only international criminal law, but also international human rights law, and any interpretation and application of law has to be consistent with internationally recognized human rights and without any discrimination. That's not, I'm sorry, that's not paragraph 1C, that's paragraph 3. So I'm starting from the end. Then, that's very important in relation to my question of a presidential system. The court may apply principles and rules of law as interpreted in its previous decisions. So there is no obligation, again. Similar to the position of the ICJ, only because of rule of law and legal certainty, certainty, I'm sorry, the courts rely upon their previous decisions. And that is um, then the of course, the court shall apply and you go. It's statute, elements of crimes, rules of procedure and evidence. Only where appropriate, applicable treaties and the principles and rules of international law, including the established principles of the international law of armed conflict. And I've chosen only one example here in Lubanga case because there is no definition of armed conflict within the Rome Statute, neither in the uh, elements of crime, so it had to go back to the well-known Tajic decision of an uh, armed conflict. And that is very different, failing that general principles of law derived by the court itself from national laws. So completely different approach to national laws if compared to the ICJ case law of legal systems of the world, including as appropriate, the national laws of states and so on and so on because of principle of complementarity. So um, I would like to submit that um, Narbonne principles are very important. If there was Nuremberg, maybe there would not have been ICC today. And it is true that um, there were different reasons why to establish different international judicial bodies. ICJ, because of previous, of course, the um, Permanent Code of International Justice, peaceful settlement of interstate disputes, international crimi criminal judicial bodies, prosecution of perpetrators perpetrators of crimes under international law. And there are different ways of, establish, of their establishment or their functioning. Nevertheless, all these judicial bodies, I can see the same aim, justice and application of the rule of law. What is the lesson unlearned? Sometimes I take the, the position that these are judicial bodies and they are influenced by political considerations. On the other side, you cannot get justice if you don't have peace, and therefore political considerations might have their place. Thank you for your attention. Thank you.